the Veltus retrospective after exhibition at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, being created for its subsequent showings in New York and Kyoto. The show consisted of a hundred paintings, watercolours and drawings representing the whole span of the artist's development from 1929 to the present day. Some of Beltus's greatest paintings, such as The Street and the Passage du Commerce Saint-André, were on show for the first time in years. I am a painter about whom nothing is known the artist once said. For most of his career, he has steadfastly avoided all kinds of publicity, and until recently, his work was known only to a group of fervent admirers. This whimsically arrogant self-portrait was painted when the artist was 27. Balthus, the painting name of Balthazar Klosowski, was born in Paris in 1908. A striking sketch of the artist aged 35. Balthus at the Chateau de Chassis in Burgundy, where he settled in 1953, and at work on one of the many stage and opera sets he designed. The artist today, photographed at the opening of his retrospective, I have no idea why I paint, the artist said recently. Images just happen to come from somewhere outside me. The Street, painted in 1933. A pen and ink sketch for the first version of The Street, painted in 1929. Peltus's debt to the masters of the Italian Renaissance can be best appreciated by comparing the boy's head to one of a figure in a fresco by Masaccio in Florence. The same boy, as if sleepwalking, in the later version of The Street. Here, Beltus was directly inspired by Piero de la Francesca, whose frescoes in Arezzo he had copied as a student. To refer back to the Renaissance in the early 1930s, in the midst of such powerful new movements as surrealism, required remarkable independence of mind. A classical inspiration underlies the whole composition, but the painting is also alive with wry observations of Paris street life. Cathy Dressing of 1933, an enormously productive year during which Balthus made a series of pen and ink illustrations for Wuthering Heights, the Emily Bronte novel whose tale of doomed passion had haunted the artist's own adolescence.
Balthus portrays himself as Heathcliff, the brooding, violent hero of Wuthering Heights. His first wife, Antoinette, was the model for the ill-fated heroine, Cathy. A subtly disturbing portrait of a girl called Alice, which the French poet Artaud said, invites one to love without dissembling any of love's dangers. Like Alice, the window is also of 1933. the children, so admired by Picasso that he bought it for his own collection. Balthus once said that for him childhood was the heroic age of man. In the Keys, Balthus captured the quirky flavour of the ancient village-like Paris he himself lived in. The artist walks out of this familiar scene to reappear in his first major landscape, the mountain of 1937, the most ambitious composition he had ever attempted. The mountain is above all a vast setting for several figures. One of which refers directly back to Poussin's Narcissus. The grandeur of the scene comes from the artist's masterly handling of space. The eye is kept moving from figure to figure in this tautly constructed picture. comes at last to the standing girl whose upstretched arms reach towards the mountain sky. André Durin's insistence on the need to return to traditional values in painting had deeply impressed Balthus. Here Durin looms portentously into the foreground, dwarfing everything by bulk and the intensity of his personality. Less daunting than the corpulent Durin, Joan Miro, shown with his daughter Dolores, was painted by Balthus at the request of their Paris dealer, Pierre Loeb. Cats are the privileged spectators of Balthus's world, particularly in his most intimate scenes where adolescent girls give themselves up to their fantasies or their dreams. However playful such scenes appear, they are never innocent. Balthus's adolescence bask in the intense, troubling sun of early sexuality.
Therese Dreaming of 1938 contains one of the artist's most memorable blends of eroticism and sulky innocence, encapsulating what one American critic called the lassitudes, torments, ecstasies and introspection of adolescent children. Again, the only creature privy to the girl's dreams is the cat, which reappears large as a lion and twice as hungry in the sign Belchus painted for a Paris seafood restaurant, where the artist used to eat with his friends, Camus and Malraux. The aggressive vitality of this picture turns to something more sinister in the victim. An inert nude is portrayed as if dead. nineteen thirty seven for instance is anything but still through the stabbed bread and smashed decanter comes a gust of rage violence gives way in the girl in green and red to the conscious symmetry and calm of a renaissance portrait the contrast between the warm and cold tones of the picture shows the artist's instinctive mastery of color at its most satisfying The rich, hot colours of a blazing fire play over cool flesh tones in the golden days of 1944-45 to 45 to produce one of the most seductive canvases Belchus has ever painted. This is Larchon, southeast of Paris, photographed today and as Balthus painted it in 1939. Landscape was to take on more and more importance in Balthus's work. More idyllic is the sun-gilded landscape of Chanrevent, reminiscent of Poussin in the way it seems inhabited and blessed by ancient gods. The cherry tree, 1940, harks back to Poussin's autumn landscape. But its gracefully adolescent heroine and the pattern of cool shadow and warm sunlight make it unmistakably Balthusian. The artist's love of enigma is exemplified in this game of cards, painted ten years later. It seems clear that the confidently smiling girl will win over the dumbfounded youth. But what exactly are the stakes these two strange adolescents are playing for? Balthus gives few clues to his paintings. 
Not even preparatory studies take one much nearer to the heart of their mystery, especially in a work such as the Passage du Commerce Saint-André. The Passage is one of the largest and in many ways the most completely satisfying of all the artist's works. It is also the most elusive and has given rise to every kind of conjecture. Does it represent the three ages of man? Did the artist include members of his own family, such as his mother and his brother? Did he put himself in, straight-backed and carrying a baguette of bread like the golden scepter of his power to enchant? Whatever the answers, the painting's inner secret remains, sealed by the artist's ability always to suggest rather than to state. Three sisters were the daughters of a Paris art dealer whom Balthus knew well. The picture's subtle varieties of contrasted tone indicate the artist's increasing preoccupation with purely painterly effects. Another version of the Three Sisters, completed ten years later, shows how much lighter his palette was to grow. Colour of an almost ethereal lightness is married in nude in front of a mantle to an Egyptian-like monumentality of form. Called Landscape with Trees, this picture records one of the views from the Chateau de Chassis in Burgundy where Balthus lived in virtual seclusion from 1953 to 1961. Large landscape with cow, 1959-1960. This recent photograph shows the view from one of the windows at Chassis, which has hardly changed from the days when Balthus painted Frédéric, his niece, and at that time his favourite model. Frédéric is shown here gazing out on the same scene in Girl at a Window. The austere atmosphere of the estate is admirably caught in farm courtyard at Chassis and the large landscape with a tree, where the view is reduced to its bare bones. The least significant detail is man himself. Subtle patterns of form and colour have always fascinated Balthus, but in The Fortune Teller of 1956 they become his only concern. Young girls asleep or daydreaming had long been the artist's favourite subject, but in dream number one he brought the theme to a new point of lyrical intensity. Colours such as the blood-red flower take on a dream-like power to astonish and convince. In the second version of the dream, the flower-bearing figure exactly recalls the angel in a traditional Annunciation scene.
The Golden Fruit of 1956 treats the same theme. A disturbingly ugly fruit bearer tinges the scene with a nightmarish quality that disappears altogether from the studied harmony of Golden Afternoon. The Turkish room at the French Academy in Rome, where Balthus became director in 1961, provided the background to one of his most famous pictures. Katya Reading, begun in 1968 and finished in 1976. These dates indicate not only the artist's painstaking care, but also the fact that his time was increasingly taken up by his duties as France's cultural ambassador in Rome. From the same period, a theme resumed after many years, the card player. This time, however, the figures appear deliberately grotesque. The honey-coloured, rough-cast walls of the Villa Medici, which houses the French Academy in Rome, provided the background for this nude in profile. Details of Belchus's pictures can often be traced to the places where he worked on them. The cat in the mirror. During the 1970s, the artist experimented with thicker, more deeply worked textures in his paintings. Off and sleeping nude, recall that Balthus has pursued an ideal of human beauty in which, over the years, eroticism has given way to a notion of luminous grace. Half a century later, some of the earlier paintings still provoke widely differing opinions. And you make the balls and think and dream instead of looking at Picasso. Oui, on dit qu'il a un regard pervers sur les sur l'enfance. But everything is erotic. The household, the, the women. Simplement le fond. Avec ces montagnes-là, qui sont des montagnes du Jura. C'est pas musical, c'est silencieux. C'est even more mysterious, no? Because it's surreal and not surreal at the same time. Ça dérange quoi? The painter and his model, 1980-81, the largest of Balthus's recent compositions and the one on which the Centre Pompidou's retrospective of his paintings ended. When the exhibition opened, Balthus could still be termed the least known of the great contemporary painters. By the time the exhibition closed, ten weeks later, the situation had been transformed 
for no fewer than 300,000 people had come to form their own opinion of this reclusive artist's achievement.